welcome back to the Mental Work Podcast listeners. We're so excited to have you here. And today we are talking about the topic of how to take up space. There's a lot to cover in this topic, but we're going to try and break it down bit by bit so that hopefully you walk away from this episode with a little less imposter syndrome and a little more confidence in being able to speak up, particularly around more experienced colleagues. And here to help us unpack it and go through the journey is Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Bron. How are you? Yeah, well, thank you. So, Catherine, just remind listeners who you are and what you do. You've been on the podcast a few times now. I have. So, hopefully, people are getting to know me, get a sense for me. I'm a clinical psychologist by training, and I am the director and the clinic and culture manager of Socorro Psychology. So, we've got uh, three sites um, around the country. And given that I've got that title of clinic and culture manager, that should give you a few clues as to what I find really important. What I'm really passionate about is supporting our staff and supporting a culture that hopefully allows people to speak up in the organisation. So I feel quite strongly about this. Yeah, no, fantastic. And we're really glad to have you on board. So this topic actually came from a listener inquiry. So I'm going to read you out the listener inquiry, Catherine, and then we'll start unpacking it. There's often been times that I've felt that I've wanted to say something, share my opinion, or speak up about something that I didn't like in the psychology profession or my workplace, but I felt like I couldn't contribute to the conversation and even felt like I didn't deserve to contribute to the conversation, especially when it comes to more experienced psychologists whose knowledge in the field is immensely greater than mine. So this is really the basis. I mean, it's kind of imposter syndrome right? Yeah, and it's it's... Brings up a couple of things for me. I guess there's this bit of sadness that somebody feels like this, but there's also a real connection with it too, because I certainly remember, I mean, it's not gone completely for me, but I certainly remember this being a much greater part of my, you know, my sort of time in, in workplaces of just feeling like I couldn't speak up at all. So I resonate with it too. And I understand that experience totally. Yeah, no, and I resonate with it as well because, yeah, being an early career psychologist and having those very recent experiences of being in workplaces and placement, I've definitely felt like I don't want to be the squeaky wheel here. So sometimes I can see stuff that's going on, but it's like, mm, do I want to cause a fuss about this? Do I want to bring attention to myself? Mm, no, I think I will stay quiet. So there was a lot of pick your battles. And even if I picked my battle, I, I didn't really want to go down it because I felt like I would have been the one in the wrong because I was the early career one. So yeah, there's there's just a lot in here, isn't there? There's a lot. I think it, it draws this this idea draws upon, you know, really historically how women have been seen and viewed the the way that narrative has been really a male dominated uh, narrative through history, our culture, our upbringings, um, probably also something about the psychology profession itself, I'm afraid to say. And I think this does link in beautifully to your your recent podcast that you did around, you know, leadership, women in leadership roles and the way that we don't always have those leadership roles modeled to us or have people in the um in the profession necessarily role modeling this to us. Yeah. And this is like that the listener pointed to as well. They were like, you know, women especially are taught to be small and quiet and sit back and help quietly without being acknowledged. So don't speak up about their achievements or um, speak up about what's going wrong in the profession. So yeah, really there is a social aspect to it as well as perhaps a profession, a profession aspect. Yeah, I think that that idea of imposter syndrome is is really interesting culturally. You know, that was that that phrase was coined simply as a phrase for women. It wasn't applied oh, really? to men when it was first. Yeah, it was just for women. So, you know, it's this idea that we have this sense of inadequacy or we're unqualified in some way, but it's this internal sense that we hold. It's it's this internal sense of that you don't have of your own success, despite maybe external accolades or externally somebody would be looking at you and thinking, yeah, you're great. You're really competent. But it's this internal sense of I don't belong or I'm not, not competent to have a, a seat at the table. Um, and it, it was, yeah, it's it's predominantly still sort of a pathologized female experience. You know, men in, in lots of studies, men have been found to have the same level of self-doubt or imposter syndrome, but it gets pathologized as this sort of female issue. You know, you're still 
there's still so much that's aimed at women around this, you know, all the courses that you can do to be more confident or get rid of imposter syndrome. They're all aimed at women. They're not aimed at men. Mm, that's really interesting. I had no idea that imposter syndrome was just a, a female pathology. Um, but I guess historically, yeah, there's a lot of them that are just exclusively <laughs> for a female. <laughs> so, okay. Oh, lucky. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, get all the good ones. Yeah. But it, yeah, it's also like I've heard people describe it to me as like they're going to be found out any second that they don't know anything and people are going to work out that they're not meant to be there. And so I can understand that in the context of listener's question, it's like, well, if you feel like you're going to get found out for knowing nothing, then why the, why on earth would you speak up? Like, because yeah, they're just totally. going to expose you as like being a fraud. Totally. And, and again, it comes back to this sense, um, you know, uh, anybody who knows me probably from the podcast as well, I talk about Brené Brown's work a lot. What Brene Brown talks about is that when you are giving feedback or you're putting yourself out there in that way, you're taking a massive interpersonal risk. And really, we're all hardwired for connection. So we want to feel like we belong. We want connection with our teams. And if we're standing up and saying something maybe that's uh, against the status quo or not even against the status quo, just having an opinion that we are making a taking a huge interpersonal risk to do that. And so, of course, it's very threatening. To, in, to in, our, in our core, it's threatening because we could get kicked out of our group at any point, and we are hardwired to stay remaining connected to our to our groups. So it's really hard. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. I'm glad that you brought that up. And I do want to connect it to our main two themes that we're going to talk about today, because I think it really relates. So the first thing I want to talk about is how to have a voice as an early career psych within the workplace. And then I want to talk about having a voice in the wider psychology profession. Is that okay? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So let's talk about what you just said in the context of having a voice within a practice. So let's just say Scenario is that you're a newly registered psychologist and you're in your first workplace. It's a group private practice and everybody seems really nice and approachable. And you're just easing in and learning all the policies, but then you see something and you're like, huh, like, I don't know why they do that. Like that's directly opposite to what I was taught in my studies. The clients don't seem to be responding to this policy too well. Let's say it's a cancellation policy and it's just, it's really hard for me to implement. And, you know, I'm not sure it's actually working. So I want to say something, but according to like Brene Brown and what you said, it's like, I'm going to have that inner conflict of being like, well, I don't want to rock the boat. Yeah, totally. And, and I, what I bring it back to usually is that most of us will have clients. I think we work with clients usually who've got this belief that they need to earn their space in the world, that they're not enough unless they are, I don't know, you know, funny, smart, beautiful, you know, heterosexual women have to be attached to a man. There's all these ways that people need to be in the world, especially women, in order to sort of validate taking up space. And I think most of us as psychologists, when we're working with people like that, are talking to our clients about you deserve to take up space in the world, no matter how funny, interesting, smart, et cetera, et cetera, you are. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. You don't need to earn your space. So why don't we take our own medicine on yeah. that? Why don't we listen to our own advice? Oh my gosh, it's so true. Like if I was in a session with a client, I'd be like, yeah, your opinion matters. Like it's very important and you have a valid opinion to share and I support you in sharing this opinion. Like I would, <laughs> I would pretty much say exactly that. So I, I don't know the I don't know for sure, but I think that probably you know seventy nine percent eighty percent of the workforce in psychology is women. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and I just wonder if you know we've a lot of us have been conditioned to we've been told maybe we're not right, we're not good, we're not enough if we don't follow certain rules in society, and some of us have maybe covertly, overtly given been given messages like you know you don't speak unless you're spoken to or you don't have a right to take up space here um you know as kids you know there's lots of studies about kids I find this fascinating if boys come to you with a conflict they're more likely to give in advice of let's go resolve it how are you going to talk to them what are you going to do about it girls are told Shh, don't make a fuss oh. just pretend they're not pretend it's not happening just ignore them 
So even from a really young age, we're taught to not stand up for ourselves, to not speak up, not rock the boat. And it's conditioned in us. That's so really sad. Like it's it, that socialization is really sad. And it seems like that's carrying on and maybe perpetuating this imposter syndrome that we feel as early career psychologists. Yeah, I mean, I can't know for sure, but I'm sure I I would imagine that it's having a big part to play. Yeah. So, okay. So maybe like the first recommendation we're giving to listeners is like, you don't need to earn your space. You already deserve to take up space. But what if, Catherine, there'll be a (laughs) listener who's like, but what if they know more than me? Like they are objectively, like they have more experience and knowledge than me. And I want to tell them about this policy that I'm not sure is working. Um, Okay. I believe I have space, but uh, what do I do next? For me, uh, what I found really helpful, there's a couple of things I found helpful. Um, One is Glennon Doyle's book. I don't know if, if, if listeners are aware of it. It's called Untamed. Okay. That book talks about basically talks about what are the rules in society, in your family that you have been taught that you need to jettison. Let's examine and examine them and let's look at which ones are serving you and which ones are not serving you. And so that uh, for me particularly, I found that really helpful to be able to just look at it and go, you know, why Why do I believe that I don't have the right to speak up here? Where's that come from? And if it's just a covert message that I've received from my family, well, that's not serving me at all. So I'm going to jettison that one. It's not useful for me at all. Mm. And I think the other thing is is remembering that confidence doesn't equal competence. You can get some people who present their ideas very confidently but they don't actually know what they're talking about. <laughs> yeah, there's been a few studies that I've read about that as well, that um, sometimes people are more likely to speak in meetings and they'll take up more space. But when you ask people what the key messages were, it's like, it's a lot of nothing. And it's like, oh, okay, that person was just saying, but not actually contributing meaningfully to the conversation. Yeah. And, and again, you get this culture, I think, often where it's perpetuated, you know, the, the leader in inverted commas of the, of the meeting or the, you know, the owner, the boss is the one who's looked to for these answers, for these ideas. And so they have to maintain this position of authority. And I think traditionally it's been seen that if you are tentative or if you are curious or if you're asking questions or unsure about an outcome, that that's somehow weak and you're not a good leader. Mm. I think we're starting starting to move towards understanding that actually asking questions, being tentative, getting multiple perspectives is very valuable as a leader, but we're probably still only moving into that space. Yeah. It's really interesting you bring that up because that's like exactly like my style of leadership that I adopt. I love asking questions and I've, and I've thought about this a lot and I think it's because I don't see not knowing something as a weakness. Like I've never, yeah. I've never thought that just because you don't know something that it's a weakness and it doesn't mean that you deserve to ask questions and be curious about it and be humble and be like, look, I don't know what's going on here, but like, I'm wondering like if you could help me understand this. And yeah, I think I was just never socialized to learn that, that the other way, which is, which is nice. It's perfect. The, the phrase that always reminds me of that is one, it's something like I'm here to get it right, not to be right. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like you're a great leader. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> just like, <laughs> doing all of that. <laughs> Puff myself up. Um, but yeah. yeah, it's but yeah, I'm just like so not afraid of not knowing. And I feel like that comes with imposter syndrome as well. It's like terror that like you'll be exposed to not knowing, but I don't think it's weak to to not know. It's really just how how could you know everything? It's like you're a student, you're an early career psych, like you are on the journey to learning, and that is not weak. And again, I think similarly to clients often who'll be saying, you know, why am I the one who has to learn the skills? Why am I the one who has to work hard when the system's shit, whatever? Yeah. But, you know, actually you can use that to your advantage as an early career site. You can be going in there with curiosity. You know, actually, I don't know how this works. Or can you explain to me why it is this way? And you can almost play upon being a bit naive. Yeah, I've done that. <laughs> it works really well. <laughs> but it's just like, just student, don't know anything. Um, help me out here. Um, I don't get this. So like, you know, I guess like with this first maybe dilemma of asking for help or voicing like that you don't understand a policy or the way it's implemented, my recommendation would be like just to approach it with curiosity. So don't be afraid to speak up, but be like, I don't really get what's happening here. Could you help me understand? Is that what something along the lines you would recommend as well, Catherine? Totally. And I think it goes again to that sort of curiosity, doesn't it? And just 
checking out if you can just shift the status quo a bit, just because it's always been done this way doesn't mean we have to keep doing it this way. Mm. You know, I'm curious as to what would happen if we tried something different here. Yeah. And, you know, you're bringing value to the table anyway. You've got, you know, the, the amount of early career psychs I speak to, and I'm amazed they've because they've just come out of uni, they've just done all their studies, you know, they're fresh and they know it all. I can't, if you ask me some of those things, I can't remember. They bring a huge amount of knowledge and, and value. So it's also rem- remembering that you're there and you're bringing a really important perspective. And, and the hope is that if you can disrupt the status quo a little bit, you can be helping the whole group to bring in new perspectives and benefit from that flexibility of thought and understanding that, hey, you can have a different approach to these meetings or these discussions. It doesn't have to be the same way it always was. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really valuable to hear. So I've got two questions for you, Catherine. So the first is, as a practice owner, what is it like for you when, say, early career psychologists raise stuff with you about processes or procedures and they're like, you know, I don't get why we're doing our assessments this way or like the cancellation policy, like it just seems a bit off for some clients. Like, what do you feel when people bring that stuff up to you? I'm probably a bit weird. Okay. Okay. Because I'm like, yes, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. I really appreciate that anybody giving me any feedback is an interpersonal risk and it's a gift that I need to receive as such. I need the, my first words out of my mouth need to be, thank you. Thank you for bringing this to me. I appreciate it and go from there. And and I value anybody who's got any kind of feedback for us it's invaluable. And and that's what I mean, I guess, about shifting the status quo a bit. It's helping organizations to see that giving them feedback, having a different perspective, bringing something else to the table is immensely valuable. And if you can get them to see that, then you're, you're, you've done a lot of hard work. So you're telling me that if someone brings something to you, you're not like, like, okay, they're a troublemaker and they've got a black mark against their name. Totally not. Cool. Totally not. I mean, I'm not perfect. And and sometimes there's there's somebody in particular, one of my administrators, who you know, I used to have a very bad habit. She'd come to me and she'd tell me something I'd be like, for fuck. <laughs> 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 and so she raised it with me. She was like, you know what? It makes me not want to bring stuff to you yeah. because you, you know, you swear at me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I have we have this joke now that I'm like, you know, I'm trying very hard to suppress my FFS. Yeah. And I'm going to actually now just say thank you. And then I maybe I'll go off and mutter to myself in the background. But no, I want people to be able to bring anything to me mm. because it's so valuable to me. Yeah. And I know you said before that maybe your response is a bit weird, but do you think like other practice owners could have a similar response in that they're really grateful for feedback? I would hope so. I'd hope that they, if they're not already doing that, that they would cultivate that because this is a wealth of information that you, you've you got here, all these different perspectives. We need to encourage diversity in, in our, you know, in our understanding in, in what we're being, um, when what gets talked about. So anything that encourages psychological safety in our workplaces is a massive bonus. Yeah, absolutely. So it's like, I just had this thought that it's really good to know feedback from the practitioners as well, because if they're experiencing discomfort with a policy or procedure, then chances are that clients might be responding negatively to it as well. And then it's like, you want to know about that so you can improve your client care, right? Totally. Yeah. You want to know about that, don't you? Not have it disrupt your business. Yeah. So it's really valuable. I think so. Yeah. Good. Okay. Okay. Second question. So I spoke about just before how like I just wasn't socialized to believe that lack of knowledge is is bad or weak or anything. And I think that really helps me in just being curious and asking questions and kind of rocking the boat. I'm just like, whatever. Um, I just want to (laughs) know. But I'm curious to know, Catherine, if you have been raised with anything that you've needed to let go of and that has helped you have more of a voice and give feedback in your workplaces. I I think what's been hard for me is that I've always been the kind of person, if you tell me to zig, I'm going to zag. Yeah. Like I'm going to, I need to really understand why you want me to do something. And it's got to be a really good reason. Otherwise I'm just not going to do it. (laughs) And so I've probably had the opposite problem in that I've been too outspoken, too bolshy, too just gung ho with things. And I've had to really rein that back actually and be less 
outspoken and be a bit more thoughtful and a bit more um, deliberate and um, take on a, a lot of other people's views. So I work really hard to do that. Um, again, something that Brené Brown talks about is, you know, when you get feedback or you hear something difficult or something that's uncomfortable, we tend to all either do the puff up puffer fish kind of thing, you know, and get maybe aggressive or defensive, or we do the shrink down and we sort of make ourselves small and insignificant. So that, that's that been really useful for me to just look at, you know, how, how am I responding when I'm getting feedback and can I just remain neutral instead of puffing up, which is my go-to. Ah, okay. Yep. So, so it sounds like you haven't, have you experienced much of this imposter syndrome kind of feelings like this self-doubt? Certainly. And I still do, you know, I'm still, I'm constantly getting into fights with people, you know, <laughs> on social media and things. And, and yeah, there's always times when I think, oh shit, I could have said that better or that was a bit blunt or, you know, that might have offended somebody. I'm, I'm, of course, it's a work in progress. I try hard, but I'm nobody's perfect, are they? Yeah, no, not at all. So it's like, you know, even if we deserve to take up space, which we do, it doesn't mean that we're going to get these interpersonal interactions right air quotes all the time because it's just it's just hard to to do right yeah it's really hard to do yeah I I, I sound probably very corny but I think you know, having learned DBT having gone through you know I'm an intensively trained DBT therapist so it's a year-long training oh wow so you really get immersed in the skills you have to practice them constantly and I I truly believe that those DBT skills have made me so much more effective in my emotion regulation, which I think you need in order to be able to then respond to people appropriately and interpersonally have the skills to have conversations or speak up. So I think a lot of those DBT skills, especially around interpersonal effectiveness and and speaking up in meetings and things are are really invaluable. And, And they would sort of be, I guess, around my top tips for having conversations or speaking up, a lot of them are around DBT strategies, really. Wow. No, I love DBT too. Like I think almost daily, I either mention Dear Man Fast or Give, um, (laughs) all three. Um, And then I talk about validation, the importance of validation and giving validation to other people and receiving validation and feedback. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Where did you do your DBT um, year-long intensive through? Oh, I did it in the UK, actually. So um, it was through Behaviour Tech oh, cool. in the UK. Oh, mm. wow. Amazing. Um, no, that's fantastic. And it's so good to hear that your DBT skills have helped you in this area. I feel like, I feel like, yeah, they're really good just to know as a practitioner and just to implement in your own life, hey? I think they're, I mean, they've backed by research. Yeah. So they're found to be effective, but they're brilliant. So, you know, if you do struggle with speaking up in meetings or things, having that that sort of um, background or knowing those skills, really invaluable, you know, preparing what you're going to say ahead of time, maybe doing like your dear man script, writing those things out. Um, I think a big one is not to censor yourself. So we can just get up in our heads to such a degree that we don't, we miss our opportunity and we're still chattering away to ourselves. So, you know, that mindfulness experience of, no, I'm just going to do this. It's what's in line with my values and what am I actually contributing here? What are they missing out on if I don't speak? So sort of not censoring ourselves and getting all up in our heads, but just doing it is is another kind of DBT thing. Yeah. Um, and that practice, practice, practice idea as well as a DBT skill of just maybe fake it till you make it or just practice tentatively with colleagues that you trust and respect and just ask questions around the water cooler kind of thing rather than in the big meetings and just practice your skills on people till you feel like, okay, I've, I've got this now. Yes, absolutely. I would 100% agree with that. And I was just thinking that I often tell myself to be gentle, which is part of the dear man, because I can be a bit firm when I'm implementing boundaries. And it's a common mistake. I used to make it when I was first going from passive to assertive communication. And I find this in my clients as well. Sometimes we can skip assertive and then go into aggressive. And so I had to really remind myself, and I still do, like, go gently, be nice, like, but you, you know, you can still be firm, but be gentle. Totally. I think I think people do generally struggle with that idea. There's actually a really beautiful meditation from a lady called Roshi Joan Halifax. I don't know if you're familiar, no, but I'm she not. talks about strong back, soft front. Oh. And she talks about, you know, your strong back is your values, standing in your power, being assertive, and at the same time having this soft openness, this compassion, this willingness to listen and being gentle at the same time. And you can do both at the same time. Yeah. 
again, I wonder because we've maybe not had it modeled to us from many women. We maybe don't know that we can be boundaried and gentle at the same time. And we do overshoot a bit sometimes. I know I do. Oh, yes. Yeah. No, I completely agree. I think it's completely been lack of role modeling um, because sometimes like I look to female politicians as the leader and they need to be very strong backed. I don't think they can actually present a soft front. So I think that's where I actually got it from. And I was like, okay, just follow them. Um, yeah. and, then, and then that's way too hard for like every day interpersonal interactions and then you have to learn the the soft front and I learned it through like the hard way of like going over and then having negative interactions and then being like okay you can't do that Bronwyn you need to pull back. Mm. To be fair I've had some really great female leaders role model to me as well you know I've often do think you know what would Lorraine do what would Rachel do yeah. you know, etc I've got some people in my head that I think you know they do it beautifully. They've got this really great way of being assertive, but keeping people liking them at the end of the interaction. So, you know, I've had, I've had some really great experiences too. No, that's fantastic. And it's good to hear. And I'll add that um, person that you mentioned to the show notes. What was their name again? Roshi Joan Halifax. Okay. I'll look it up. I'll add it to the show notes. Thank you. I really love that. It's a great meditation. I do it a lot. Okay. So just moving on to having a voice in the wider psychology profession. So I haven't mentioned that I'm going to ask you about this, Catherine, but like, you know, I know something that you're passionate about is contracting, for instance, and sham contracting. And, you know, like you have opinions that might differ to other psychologists in this field. So I'm curious to know from you, like what leads you to speak up about it and how do you manage disagreements between yourself and other colleagues in a professional way? A good question. And I think sometimes I don't get this quite spot on. Um, couple of things I think I try and hold in mind is that just because you disagree with somebody doesn't make you less worthy. It doesn't make you wrong. And it's okay to have a disagreement. It's just a dialectical tension. It's okay to have a disagreement um, as long as you can do that in a respectful way. And it's, it's, it's no comment on your worth at all. Um, and you'd hope that there are we're getting better as a community of of accepting that we have differences and we have different opinions. And like we are as therapists, you know, we're incredibly flexible and compassionate with a whole range of things that don't necessarily fit with our own values. So you'd hope as a community that we would bring that to our, our discussions in the community as well. Um, I don't know that it always happens in that way, but... Yeah, I think that's one of the things that um, I struggle with as an early career psych. And I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but we have this expectation that because we're so compassionate and kind, and it's really true. Like I hear opinions every day um, when I'm in therapy that don't actually match up with what I truly think as, you know, personal me. And yet I am compassionate and empathetic and I work with those views. And I would hope that psychologists would bring that to their professional interactions, but I don't always see that, which leads to a bit of disillusionment. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what makes it hard for people, isn't it? It's this idea of why is our profession like this when actually as individuals, we're very much aligned with empathy and validation and non-judgment. So why, when we get into a group forum, does that all go out the window? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know why. We just like seem to forget ourselves. (laughs) It's like, come on guys, just bring a bit of civility to the discussion. Perhaps we perhaps we work so hard in the day to just yeah. keep it together that know, it, right? it's like a kid coming home from school. Yeah. It's like a, a massive tantrum. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like it's exactly that. Um, okay, so but I really like your point that it's like just because you have a disagreement with somebody doesn't mean that you are worth any less. It's like you're allowed to have that dialectical tension between you, and it doesn't mean that you know you're less entitled to space or or less entitled to take up that opinion. But it can feel really crummy um, when you do disagree with people, right? Yeah, it can. And and this is the second part I think that I try and um abide by, I guess, is is this um, you know, Brene Brown again popularized. <laughs> yeah, she's great. <laughs> I get I get royalties every time I say her name. <laughs> she like <laughs> She 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 popularized the Theodore Roosevelt quote, but it it you know obviously it's 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 been around for a very long time. But the analogy that she uses, I think, is really crucial. You know, so he talks about you know it's not the critic who counts; it's not the one who's kind of sitting on the cheap sheet, cheap seats, 
shouting stuff at you. It's the one who's in the arena with you, getting dirtied, getting bloodied in there in the fight with you. So I think for me, I just hold fast to that. You know what? Would I go to this person and ask for their opinion ordinarily? Would I listen to criticism or feedback from this person ordinarily? Are they in the arena getting their ass kicked with me? Or are they just somebody out in the cheap shit? cheap seats, just shouting abuse or, you know, being able to just throw stuff in there that actually I'm not going to listen to because I wouldn't listen to you if you were here in front of me because you're not one of my people. So I'm not going to listen to you on social media or anything like that. So that that helps me to just remind myself, you know what, this this person's opinion doesn't actually matter to me. I wouldn't be asking them for advice. So I'm not going to let them bother me. Yes. I think that's really important to create people who you do listen to as well, as well as people here, just like, look, I'm just not going to let that affect me. Like you're right. It's like, they're not in the arena fighting with me. They don't know what it's like. They're kind of just a spectator looking in and giving their opinion where it's like not kind of, it's just not an informed opinion. Yeah, totally. And again, that's where that soft, soft front, strong back comes in because you don't want to just blanket not listen to anybody who's yes. giving you feedback. You want to be able to take on some criticism and feedback, but you also need to be able to sort of filter out the stuff that is not important for you and is just upsetting you or, you know, burning you out. Mm, yes, 100%. If you're seeing something in mental health as an early career psychologist, like let's just say that you're really passionate about climate change and you think that your professional bodies should be taking more action or have a stronger stance on fighting climate change and recognizing the impacts of mental on mental health and on community mental health. But, you know, you've got this fear that, you know, who am I? I'm an early career psych. Who am I to contribute to this conversation? Especially when there are people who are like, you know, climate psychologists, experts who who are already doing lots of work in this space. Um, what would you say to this person? I'd come at it from two aspects, I think. So this, uh, this idea of Im- imposter syndrome as being pathologized, there's this really amazing article in the Harvard Business Review by um, Jody Anbury and Rachika Tolshan. And they wrote, they wrote two articles, actually. The first one is Stop Telling Women They Have Imposter Syndrome. And then their follow-up article was entitled How to Deal with Imposter Syndrome in Your Workplace. And the second article gives some really great practical strategies for creating that culture of belonging. But the whole premise of the article, I think, is really important because it's saying, basically, don't make me feel like I don't belong because of who I authentically am. And then when I'm struggling to belong because of the culture that you've built, then tell me, oh, dear, you've got imposter syndrome, poor thing, poor thing. Mm. So I, I think there's something about us as maybe as women, but as a, as a profession, probably, of not shaming one another, not feeling shame ourselves when we're speaking up, but actively encouraging, validating other people to speak up, particularly with a diversity of experiences and actually welcoming that diversity as, as being a helpful thing. Yeah. No, I think that's really, that's really powerful. Okay. What's the next bit? So this, the second bit would be around, well, who else is going to do it? Like if you don't, if everybody just said, oh no, this is too hard. I'm too scared. I don't want to. Somebody else has got more experience than me. Then maybe nobody would do it. And so at the end of the day, why are you wanting to do this? Why are you wanting to speak up about something? Is it aligning with your values? Who's missing out if you don't do it? So I often think about the inverse effect. You know, if, if nobody stood up and ever put their head up above the parapet, then maybe we'd have no change. We'd have no activism. We'd have nobody doing any of this stuff. So even if you feel like it's just a drop in the ocean, it's something. And even your acts might encourage other people as well to then stand up and say something against the status quo. Yeah, that's literally how I live my life. So um, one of my favorite bits of research is about the bystander effect. And I mean, this is psychology 101 that everybody would have learned in undergrad, but it's like other people in a social group and you're in an emergency, they'll assume that the other person, for example, is going to call triple zero, but then nobody calls triple zero. So you have to be the person who is calling triple zero and not assume that everybody else is going to do it. And that's pretty much how I live my life. I'm like, is somebody rendering help? Nobody's going to render help. I have to be the person who steps up and renders help. And it's the same approach with this podcast. It's like, I can't see anybody else doing it. And if nobody does it, then nobody will. And so, okay, I'll do it. 
I would encourage everybody to do that as well. I know it's pretty rare, but it's like, if you know the research, it's like, everybody's thinking that everyone else is going to do it, but then nobody does it. Yeah. And what's worse, somebody doing it or nobody doing it. Exactly. Yeah. So I also took away from your first point that it's really important to encourage each other when we do speak up. So it's like, as soon as somebody speaks up and they're like, Hey, like climate change, really important to me. Abortion rights, really important to me. Um, I think, you know, relevant to the field of psychology in our profession. It's like, you might not agree with their perspective, but encourage them to speak up and be like, yes, it's important to share this opinion. I'm always in favor of any disruption. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, disrupt disrupt the status quo, disrupt yeah. the cycle of us questioning ourselves. Yeah. Stand up for each other. Be like, yes, well done for standing up. Well done for putting yourself out there. Even mm. if something is a flop, well, you know what? This is a great learning opportunity and you've been brave to put yourself out there. So good on you. Yes. And I guess like with listeners, I would encourage them as well, like, you know, contribute to your professional body. So I'm a bit biased, obviously being a director of AAPI, but I know that if you email Tegan, I'll chuck an email in the, in the show notes. And, or if you email AAPI, we'd love hearing stuff about what you're passionate about. And I know the other professional bodies do as well. It's really important. It really does guide the organization. So for AAPI, we are predominantly member led. That's our jam. Um, So yeah, I really value opinions and I'll be the first one to be like, I welcome that. Yeah, it's great to hear. I hope more organizations are really adopting that stand. Any other tips for early career psychs in being afraid to share their opinion about the profession? Like, I I guess they're afraid of judgment from their colleagues or their more experienced colleagues who will shut them down. Yeah. And I I do think, I I think it's valid. I think it's a real thing that 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 can happen. I don't think they're imagining it, but um, I think unless people start uh, disrupting that status quo, then we're never going to get any change. And and again, it comes back to, you know, why should I have to be the one to do this? This is really hard. This is really upsetting. I'm putting myself out there, but if if nobody does it, then nothing's going to change. Yeah, pretty much. And yeah, I would say to listeners, like we get to decide what the future of the profession looks like, but we don't get to decide if we're just going to sit back passively and sit in like our chair and just rock back and forth. It's like, we've got to be there. Yeah. If nothing changes, then nothing's going to change. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Let me just see if there's any other questions that I wanted to get through. We had a specific question, a specific point by a listener, and they were like, how to put yourself out there professionally in regard to contributing to the field, such as appearing on a podcast, in the media, promoting yourself. Um, So I just thought you could speak to this, Catherine, as a podcast guest. (laughs) Um, How do you feel about putting yourself out there on a podcast? Look, look, I don't love it. (laughs) (laughs) But so two things I think might come into this. One one is that I think I certainly have been affected by the ethical guidelines around marketing that UPRA, APS, whoever put out there. And I know that I've always been very tentative about what can I say? What can't I say? How do I market my business? How can I market myself, my staff? And a bit of sort of anxiety or reluctance about that because we, we can't kind of do a huge amount there. We can't say certain things. We can't put testimonials up, you know. So I wonder if sometimes people are a bit worried about promoting themselves because they may be fearful that they're going to get reprimanded or they, they're they not doing the right thing. So I wonder if that comes into it partly. For me, I, I've got to the position where I think it's just brave to give something a go. So I don't really care what the outcome is. The impact for me is just about giving it a crack. So if I've put myself out there, I've gone to speak at a seminar or something, if it's been a flop, I just go, you know what? It's been a great learning experience and I've put myself out there. I'm the one in the arena right now being brave. That's what's important to me. So I would encourage people to just try and be brave. And if it's in line with their values, if it's helpful, if it's doing what they want and they feel passionate about, I don't think there's anything that was wrong about that, even if it is a, let's call it a failure. I don't believe in the word failure, a learning opportunity. If it doesn't go the way you hope, well, you know what? You're the one that's been brave putting yourself out there. So good on you. Yeah. So you can still feel proud of yourself, even if it doesn't work out as you had hoped or imagined. Totally. Yeah. 
No, I resonate with that 100%. And I was just reflecting on my own experiences as you were talking. And like, I, I've done a lot of public speaking. I have flopped in public speeches in front of hundreds of people. I have done rubbish speeches and I've done really good speeches and I've done really good advocacy and I've done really poor advocacy. Um, but it's all exposure and it was all a great learning experience. And I'd be like, well, point do that again. <laughs> Ditto. Completely yeah. resonate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but it's like, I just... I just do it. Like, <laughs> I'm just like, no, I believe this is important. I don't believe that my opinion is the best opinion. Far from it. I'm just like, but someone needs to say this and I believe that other people are feeling the same way or thinking something along the same lines. And if we had more of that, we'd have more cultures in organisations where people didn't feel they had to get it right. They, yeah. were, they were trying to do it right, you know, mm. where everybody accepted we're fallible, we make mistakes. Uh, this is just an opinion. We'd have so much more flexibility, fluidity in our in our organizations, and they'd be so much richer for it. So again, it's another reason why people should keep doing it because it's going to affect the changes in our organizations that we want to see. Mm. And I think that's a beautiful point to end on. Thank you so much, Catherine, for coming on and talking about this. And listeners, I hope you've got something good to take away. I think I think we covered a lot here. I hope it's been helpful. I hope I hope the message is it's really hard, but it's worth trying to do. Yeah, in a nutshell, that's yeah, I would agree with that. And yeah, I'm glad that I'm speaking out. And yeah, if if any of you listeners want to speak out, I'll support you. And I know Catherine would support you as well. Yeah, I'm always I'm always here to disrupt the status quo. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and on that note, we'll finish up. Thanks, listeners, for listening. Thanks, Catherine, for coming on once again and for your insights and expertise. And have a good one, listeners. Catch you next time. 